Johnny Group, your, uh, your heart failure, your observational research program, all cause death and heart failure re hospitalization rates is particularly high in the acute heart failure. It is also high in the chronic heart failure, sitting with a one year mortality of, uh, for chronic heart failure, 7%, in the acute heart failure, it is 17%. And we all know that modern management of chronic heart failure is now largely based on neurohormonal hypothesis we all are familiar with, which states that neuroendocrine activation is important in the progression uh, of the heart failure and also inhibition of neurohormones are likely to have long-term benefits with regard to morbidity and mortality, and it is, an, it is now a proven fact. When we look at the epidemiology of the heart failure, we know, we know that with the clinical uh, criteria, we end up with the prevalence of 2% we, if we think of the uh, overall population. And we all know that also males and females are equal, although half ref, namely heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is more prevalent in males, and the half path, namely diastolic heart failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is more common in females. And we all know that almost 50% is asymptomatic, and also we end up with half ref is equal to half path. And when we look at the pathogenesis of heart failure, we always see an index event, inciting index event, and which leads to downward spiral, accompanied by a secondary damage, mainly driven by the acute heart failure decompensations. And at the end, we uh, see down going ejection fraction from a transition of asymptomatic phase to a heavily symptomatic phase. And during this course, this, this takes years, of course, in, in, in a usual patient, there are some compensatory mechanisms trying to overcome the bad guys in the history. So it's a complex mechanism. It's a multi-system syndrome, along with the abnormalities of cardiac and the skeletal muscles. Of course, abnormality of the renal function, we all know that cardiorenal syndrome, it is actually Heart failure is a cardiorenal syndrome, along with the, accompanied by the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. It's a complex pattern of neurohormones interacting with each other. It is always accompanied by ventricular remodeling, along with the damage to myocytes, extracellular matrix, so changes in the size and the shape and the function of the left ventricular, left ventricle. It is accompanied by, we all know that, electrical instability, which leads to a very common arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, and also VF and the VTAC, which could be directed to the implantation of the ICD in this case. And of course, systemic process with a saccala in the organs. So when we look at the pathophysiology, it is the, the, the decreased cardiac output, which results in the increased antiastolic pressure, increased capillary wedge pressure, along with the activation of the neurohormonal mechanism, which are now considered, I mean, the excessive amount of neurohormonal mechanism regarded as the bad guys. Um, and mainly driven by the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, also sympathetic nervous system and other uh, circulating and the paracrine effects. And on the other hand, there are some good guys, these called counter-regulatory systems, namely natriuretic peptide systems. And when we look at the models of the heart failure, there are several models, hemodynamic model, neurohormonal model, which is the common pathway accepted, autonomic models, microenvironmental model, which is the, now the more famous uh, one recently. But the hemodynamic model, is the oldest one, actually, is a simple model of left ventricular pump dysfunction. And according to hemodynamic hypothesis, uh, the heart failure progresses just because hemodynamic stresses that are triggered by the initial injury. The heart exerts a deleterious effect on the circulation, and any loss of viable myocardium is inevitably followed by an increase in the anti pressure and volume as the heart attempts to maintain stroke volume over reduced ejection fraction. However, the, this increase in loading conditions constitutes an important hemodynamic stress for patients with heart failure and may adversely affect both functional and the structural integrity of the non-injured myocardium. And the mechanisms of hemodynamic models, several disease can contribute with, the, for example, restricted filling and increased pressure load on the ventricle, well-known reasons for that, for example, hypertension, aortic stenosis. Increased volume load on the ventricle, mainly accompanied by mitral regurgitation, it may be secondary or primary. Decreased myocardial contraction, which is mainly driven by the coronary artery disease, is a main cause of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Of course, diabetes is very prevalent. And of course, the arrhythmia can contribute to the hemodynamic model as a mechanistic pathway. We all know that ventricular remodeling is, a, is an important contributor, is, is an important parameter to take care of it. We all know that after an extensive myocardial infarction remodeling occurs inevitably, it is the uh, impaired cardiac contractility and also accompanied by, again, neurohormonal activation, which leads to regional eccentric and 
concentric hypertrophy in some cases, or the non-infarcted segment, and also it le leads to regional thinning and a dilatation of the infarct area. And of course, we all know that, the, the, for example, the larger the infarct, the higher the ventricular remodeling rate. So at the end, we see this uh, cardiac remodeling, which, which we all know it is a bad thing to, to, to consider, actually. And we all want to prevent this cardiac remodeling at every stage, at every age. Uh, so, uh, at the end, when we speak about the, the oldest model, hemodynamic model, we have the explanations and the targets. For example, the factor is the preload, increase, increased blood volume, uh, and the increased venous tone. So, what, how can I fight with, that, with it? With the salt restriction and the diuretic therapy. It's the oldest drug, actually, which we're using currently. If there's a problem with the afterload, which is associated with the resistance against with which the heart must pump, so it's actually associated with the increased sympathetic stimulation and the activation of the renin angiotensin ax, axis. So actually it is the secala or the increased activation of the sympathetic nervous system and the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis. So in the hemodynamic model, people thought that we can give just arterial or vasodilators and can prevent, can fight against with it. In the hemodynamic model, contractility is a major concern, decreased myocardial contractility, and uh, the, in the hemodynamic model, people, the physicians thought that if I give inotropic drugs, I can fix it. And the heart rate also is part of the hemodynamic model, and it's associated with the decreased contractility and the decreased stroke volume, we all know that, but it's at a certain level, it is bad. So heart rate lowering can help in the hemodynamic model. It, was it tested? Yes, hemodynamic mo model was tested in the past. Uh, just we have to study was, was actually the first clinical test of hemodynamic hypothesis. Uh, it's a multicenter randomized double blind placebo controlled trial with a considerable sizable size of patients, but half ref I'm speaking here. Patients were randomized to double blind treatment with placebo, prazosin, it's the mainly afterload reducing agents, or the combination of hydralazine plus isosorbate dinitrite. And we all know this, the result of this study, hydrolyzine combination with the isosorbate dinitrite is the best therapeutic option, and actually prazosin was equal to placebo, and actually is worse, was worse in some cases. A risk reduction was prevalent in the hydrolyzine isosorbate dinitrite group, but single, the, the physicians had finalized, concluded that the single afterload reducing therapy was not good for the chronic heart failure patients, because if I give single afterload reducing agent, I cannot fight against the activation of the neurohormonal axis. According to hemodynamic hypothesis, drugs that produce hemodynamic benefit were expected to favorably affect the natural history of heart failure. So PROMISE trial was designed to test this hypothesis, uh, included more than 1,000 patients with severe heart failure patients, and the patients were randomized to milrinone, PD-5 inhibitors, as you all know, it's an inotropic drug, and also placebo. And we all know that this study result, uh, milrinone therapy was shown to be associated with 28% increase in the mortality, contrary to common belief at that time. DIC trial also can also be considered as the, one of the trials to test the hemodynamic model. We all know that because uh, the digoxin produces the inhibition of the sodium potassium ATPase, so increase in the calcium level. So it's kind of an inotropic drug, at least at that time. And it included considerable size of patients with Chronic heart failure were randomized to digoxin and placebo, and we all know that the study result, main study result, was neutral, actually. Is it all bad, the, uh, the, the hemodynamic model? Actually, it is not that bad. We all know that. There are newer studies testing the hemodynamic model, and the, the, the most famous ones, actually, the, the ones related with the CRT therapy, cardiac resynchronization therapy, because we all know that heart failure results in, in some patients, particularly those with left bundle branch block, results in asynchronous con contraction. So if I... Uh, correct the asynchronous con uh, contraction with the CRT therapy, we all know that we end up with improved mortality and the morbidity. So it is not all bad hemodynamic model, if I speak about. The shift trial also was actually heart rate lowering therapy is also re related with the hemodynamic model. And we all know that this is a typical chronic heart failure patients, and patients were included if the heart rate is above 70 uh, beats per minute. And we all know that the primary composite endpoint, it is a composite endpoint, it is a, it's not a direct mortality-driven trial. It's the, in the subgroup, uh, the, there was a mortality benefit, but the primary composite endpoint was positive uh, for the heart rate-lowering therapy in patients with chronic uh, heart failure patients, chronic heart failure patients with a reduced ejection fraction, of course, I am speaking about. So heart rate-lowering as part of the hemodynamic model was tested, and it was positive. <clears throat> 
Are there newer ones? Yes, of course. Omecantrid micarbil is a selective cardiac myosin activator. It increases the entry rate of myosin into tightly bound first producing state of actin. It is so-called more hands pulling on the rope. And now we all know that it is increasing the duration of the systole, increasing stroke volume. It's kind of an inotrope drug actually. And now it is currently tested in the chronic heart failure setting as a cosmic heart failure study, it's chronic oral study of myosin activation to increase the contractility in heart failure. So hemodynamic model is currently also being tested. But when we see the main model, it is the neurohormonal, we all know that. And the main model of the neurohormonal axis is driven by the pathological effects of the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis. And the main modulator of this model is the angiotensin II, we all know that. And we end up with water and salt retention as the effective circulating volume increases and the perfusion of the glomerular apparatus increases. And renin angiotensin aldosterone axis and its blockade can be beneficial uh, from several perspectives in patients with heart failure because we see excess of renin angiotensin and the aldosterone axis. And when we block the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis with different drugs, we all know about them, but the newest one is the direct renin inhibitors, but the, the most commonly tested one is the AC inhibition. We also, we, many studies with the ARBs, ARBs, but MRA is also relatively newer category. Uh, it's, it's actually the old name is more famous, aldosterone receptor antagonist, but now it's called mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. It's a novel term introduced during the, uh, the, the, the heart failure guidelines. Uh, so we end up with the uh, vasoprotection if we block the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis. On the other hand, sympathetic nervous system is also a very important part. It's associated with increased heart rate, blood pressure, but also increased myocardial oxygen demand, direct toxic effects of, on the myocardium, which leads to cell death. So blockade of the sympathetic nervous system is also important, could also be important. We all know that norepinephrine is related with the prog prognosis of the patients. The higher the norepinephrine, the worse the survival of the patients with heart failure. There are also counter-regulatory systems, uh, which, which are also important against the bad guys. The new, mainly NP hormones, natriuretic peptide hormones, are also trying to overcome the bad guys in this process. We all know the natriuretic peptides in heart failure, atrial natriuretic peptides, and also brain natriuretic peptides, secreted, secreted from the atria and also ventricles mainly. There are also other natriuretic peptides acting on different organs in the endothelium, but the, this, these are could also be considered as good guys against the bad guys. Actually, heart failure is a joint neurohormonal model. There, are, there is activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, activation of the sympathetic system, which overcomes, overweight, against the NP system in the heart failure model. So actually, it is a fight on the level of endothelium as an endocrine organ. There are vasodilators, vasoconstrictors, inhibitors, promoters, inflammation inhibitors, promoters of inflammation, thrombotic, th thrombolytic factors and the thrombotic factors. They fight at the level of endothelium in patients with heart failure. What about other changes? There are also peripheral changes, arrhythmic changes, and also comorbidities. We all know that anemia, renal failure, also accompanying the heart failure course, heart failure pathogenesis, so they're important uh, contributors of the disease states. Is it tested? Yes, we all know that just the AC inhibitors are the, the most famous guys. From the asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction to severe heart failure, salt prevention, salt tre treatment, consensus arms, it is all common that we ended up with the decreased mortality rate, decreased hospitalization rate in patients mainly with a chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And when we see the overview of the long-term AC inhibitor trials, we end up with an absolute risk reduction of somewhere around 4% to 7%. So we end up with a good improvement in these patients. When we so, of course, it, we also know that sympathetic nervous system activation is an important contributor of the heart failure pro pro progression and the pathogenesis. And we also know that the effect of the beta blockade on outcome in patients with heart failure and also post myeloid ventricular dysfunction and you see, you all know these trials, CBs, US carvedilol, marriage heart failure. So we all see that decreased mortality when we give beta blockers, we block the sympathetic nervous system. And when we see the number need to treat in, in these patients, in the CBs, for example, absolute risk reduction is about 4% as well. So we see that there is an additive benefit, AC inhibitors, beta blockers, and a combined effect, and we end up with absolute risk reduction more than exceeding 7%, 6%, 8%. And then also we see that the, 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 the latest developments are 
as you all know about also before the latest one actually, was related with the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists now are accepted as the uh, common gold standard of the treatment of the chronic heart failure uh, management. And we all know that mineral corticoid receptor antagonists are also very good. And uh, you, say, you see that just they produced a uh, relative risk reduction in the mortality, about 30%, and the NNT numbers, you see very low NNT numbers. So actually, we're supposed to give almost everybody, if they are acceptably, uh, acceptable levels of renal function, we are supposed to give uh, MRAs to these patients. So when we see the effect of adding medications to devices from the baseline, AC inhibition, beta blockers, elder blockers, namely now MRAs, and with a CRT, we have a very good uh, improvement in the patients, in the management of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So the main question, have we really failed? Oh, it differs. It differs according to where you are seeing the picture. This is the SOL trial uh, published in 1991. It's a very old study, actually, from now on. And when we see the placebo arm, placebo arm the mortality, annual mortality, is about 16%. So we ended up from 16% to a level of, down to a level of 7%. It's the, it's the latest uh, study, LCZ. You're, you're, not, you're soon now going to hear about it. So if we see from where we are coming from, it's yes, yeah, we, we, nobody can say we failed. We didn't fail, actually. But if we see from the perspective of 7%, we can, we can easily say no, because we still have some more steps to overcome. Thank you very much for your attention.